The War of 1812 was often lost in the shadow of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War in American history. For Europeans, the war is also often lost in the chaotic maelstrom that is the Napoleonic era. However, the War of 1812 had both real stakes and lasting consequences. The main cause of the War of 1812 was maritime trade. Both the British and the French passed a series of laws that forbade neutral countries, like the United States, from trading with their rivals. This put the U.S. in a no-win situation, as complying with either country would automatically mean they fell afoul of the other. The British practice of impressment was also a major point of conflict. The practice was done by many navies, but the British, due to their fleet's enormous size, relied on it the most. This meant that almost any man who was a sailor in the British Isles could be forcibly drafted by the Royal Navy. The conflict arose with America, since the British would board American ships and take men they claimed were deserters from the Royal Navy. Also, the British did not recognize naturalized U.S. citizens, which meant that many new Americans could be impressed. Thousands of American sailors were impressed, and this sparked outrage and hastened the path to war. In response to both the trade restriction and impressment, the U.S. government tried a series of unsuccessful economic acts, including the Non-Intercourse Act and Macon's Bill, to attempt to force France and Britain to relent. These measures proved largely unsuccessful while crippling the U.S. economy. Other factors include the British alliance and relations with the Indian tribes in what is now the Midwest and Southern United States. Since the British still controlled Canada and parts of the upper Midwest, their interaction with the Indians was viewed as a hostile threat by the American settlers. These same settlers were engaged in a bloody and challenging struggle with the Indians of these regions. The recruitment of Indian troops into the British military in Canada was seen as confirmation of the settlers' fears. Finally, there is a very active faction in the U.S. government that cast a hungry eye at Canada and saw it as low-hanging fruit ready to drop into their lap. Views on the potential war were strongly mixed across the United States. The frontier settlers pushed for war as they saw the British as supplying and advising Indian attacks on their land. Tecumseh's confederation was at least aided in part by some British soldiers in an advisory role. In New England, the war was viewed unfavorably as it would mean even more crippling trade destruction. It was also viewed as a de facto alliance with France and as a war of imperial aggression. In other parts of the U.S., the feeling was mixed as well. Only in the West and South was the war greeted with mostly enthusiasm. This lack of enthusiasm was reflected by the vote of 7 to 49 in the House and 19 to 13 in the Senate. The U.S. was going to war, but as a country far from united. The war opened with two major fronts, the ocean and the U.S.-Canadian border. The ocean was always going to be a challenge for the Americans, as the British had the world's largest navy. However, the British faced a challenge of much of their fleet having to stay near Europe or their other colonies due to the threat of both French and now American raiders and privateers. The Great Lakes region was going to be the key for the Americans to take Canada since an invasion through New England was not in the cards due to the region's hostility to the war. On paper, the war in the Great Lakes frontier should have been decisively in the Americans' favor, and the war at sea should have been in Britain's favor. Should have been but very little went as planned in this war. In the Great Lakes, the American General Hall proceeded to launch an attack into Canada without securing the Great Lakes supply line and also managed to tip off the British when a supply ship carrying his plans was captured. This, coupled with a sizable contingent of the Ohio militia refusing to enter Canada, doomed his assault. The Niagara frontier saw no real progress and the attempted invasion of Quebec stalled when once again parts of the militia refused to cross the border. These defeats and farces left the U.S. looking for good news, which is surprisingly found at sea. The fledgling U.S. Navy scored several victories, most notably when the USS Constitution beat HMS Guerrieri. Another victory was when the USS United States and the HMS Macedonia clashed with once again the Americans prevailing. The USS Constitution struck again, defeating another frigate, the HMS Java, in the South Atlantic after a hard-fought battle. These three defeats shook the British naval confidence and gave the Americans some much-needed success. In addition, the swarms of U.S. privateers played havoc with British shipping. Insurance rates more than quadrupled as the Royal Navy found itself stretched very thin. This factor is cited by some as a major reason the British began to move towards peace talks. Meanwhile, back on land, in 1813, the Great Lakes region saw a flurry of activity as both sides rushed to build a navy on the Great Lakes. Meanwhile, the Americans raided and burned the city of York, now modern Toronto, under the command of Zebulon Pike, who perished during the battle. This burning incensed the British while offering little strategic advantage to the Americans other than being one of their first victories on land. By now, it was apparent to even the most starry-eyed Americans that the residents of Canada had no desire to throw off the British monarch. This is not surprising since many were formerly from the United States and had moved to Canada following the Revolution 
to escape what they saw as illegitimate government. By 1814, with the Napoleonic Wars in Europe over and Napoleon in exile, the British could then focus on fighting America. However, many in Britain had misgivings about the war, including Lord Wellington, who declined to take over the governorship of Canada. On the Great Lakes, the buildup continued, and a young American commander named Oliver Perry successfully moved his scratch fleet into position in Lake Erie under the nose of the British. On Lake Ontario, both sides seemed reluctant to engage each other, while on Lake Erie a decisive battle brewed. Perry knew he had to close the British supply lines to capture the city of Detroit. In a victory, with the famous phrase, we have met the enemy and they are ours, Perry successfully won a dramatic victory against the British on Lake Erie crushing any hope they had of keeping Detroit. The British invaded northern New York and headed toward Albany, the state capital. This invasion force of about 10,000 men had a sizable component of hardened veterans and posed a real threat. However, the Americans mounted a determined defense at Plattsburgh, and the British general insisted that he receive naval support. In the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, U.S. Commander Thomas Mc. Dona successfully defeated the larger British squadron in a hard-fought battle by strategically positioning his fleet inside a bay with the wind at his back. This naval defeat resulted in the large British invasion force retreating back up to Canada as their supply lines were now exposed. Meanwhile, the British put their large fleet to good use and launched amphibious raids up and down the Atlantic coast, the most famous one of these being the burning of America's capital, Washington, D.C. Following the success, the British attempted to press forward and seize Baltimore. To do that, they had to get past Fort McHenry. The bombardment and heroic stand of Fort McHenry led to the national anthem written by Francis Scott Key, who had a front row seat to the bombardment while negotiating a prisoner release. Despite the burning of the U.S. Capitol, the main objective, the treasure trove of trade goods in Baltimore, was denied as Fort McHenry held and the British were forced to sail away. A tertiary front was the war that raged between the Americans and their Indian allies against the Indians that fought the Americans. This conflict was bitter and wide-ranging, but in the end, the Americans and their native allies would prevail after the decisive victory at Horseshoe Bend, where Andrew Jackson's militia, regular army troops, and their native allies decisively crushed the largest Indian travel force. Both sides grew weary of the war as it became apparent that the British would not be able to make any major headway on the eastern seaboard and the American realized that the Canadians were not really interested in being liberated. Also, the American success in the Northwest Territory and Great Lakes meant that any British offensive along these fronts was doomed. Peace talks got underway by 1814, the British were dragging their feet. When Napoleon defeated, some in England had fixed their eyes on arguably the most important port in America. New Orleans sat at the base of the mightiest river in North America, and a vast array of crops and trade goods moved down the Mississippi to the waiting ships. Seizing this port would give them the command of the South and serve to blunt U.S. westward expansion. It would also give the British a commanding presence on the Gulf of Mexico. The Battle of New Orleans was arguably the most crucial battle of the war and could be a full video by itself. The war was technically over at the time it took place on January 8, 1815, but it is doubtful that the British would have returned New Orleans if they had succeeded in taking it. On one side, the stern and battle-hardened Old Hickory led a ragtag group of 4,500 soldiers, militia, Native Americans, and even pirates against the 8,000 men veteran British Army led by Sir Edward Packingham. Jackson made his preparations carefully by entrenching the mile-long front. The main British assault was across a long, open, marshy field that had the Americans waiting behind an earthen rampart reinforced with cotton bales. Packingham's plan was to advance under the cover of the morning mist, but the mist vanished quickly on that January morning. The British advance wilted under the murderously accurate fire, and General Packingham was slain while trying to rally the assault troop. The second British assault across the river at an outpost proved successful, but far too late, as in the span of less than an hour, 2,000 British troops were killed along with most of the senior officers. Andrew Jackson and his ragtag army had saved New Orleans, and with it, the westward expansion of the United States. The War of 1812 had several long-term consequences. First, the destruction of the Native alliances and withdrawal of the British influence from the Northwest Territory paved the way for the rapid colonization of the Midwest and the Far West by the Americans. Second, the failed invasion of Canada meant that it would stay a British colony and eventually chart its own path. Surprisingly, despite the conflict, the United States and Canada will go on to have excellent future relations and now share the longest non-fortified border in the world. Third, by holding New Orleans, the U.S. secured the Mississippi River Basin, ensuring that U.S. westward expansion would have no choke point 
in the south. The British would also never establish a commanding presence in the Gulf of Mexico. Finally, the fledgling United States had once again fought off the British Empire, proving to the world that it was a power to be reckoned with. The lines on the map may not have moved much, but the War of 1812 proved that the United States was here to stay on the world stage. Thanks for watching.